Good morning, dear students. This will be my last lecture. It's about neuromuscular junction and start by some definitions. Whenever you hear the word myopathy, think of disease of voluntary muscles. This is in general. These terms, by the way, are general terms. Myositis means inflammation within the muscle. Muscular dystrophy almost always means an inherited disorder. Myasthenia means fatigability, which is worse on exercise when you hear myasthenia. Myotonia is a sustained contraction with slow relaxation. Weakness of muscle characteristically causes weakness without reflex loss. So whenever there is muscle weakness, when you examine the patient clinically, you see that the reflexes are preserved, but this is not 100% true. Patients who have got uh, progressive muscle disease and end stage with uh, extensive atrophy, reflexes may be lost. But in general, in myopathies, reflexes are preserved. How we classify muscle diseases? We have myasthenic disorders. Uh, in this lecture, we will talk about two diseases, myasthenia gravis and Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Inflammatory myopathies, we try to cover the important uh, and uh, common subjects like polymyositis, dermatomyositis, and inclusion body myositis. It could also be caused by viral, bacterial, or, or parasitic, or sarcoidosis. We have metabolic disorders that affect the muscle. Whenever you receive a patient who has got proximal weakness, uh, almost always think of metabolic causes. It could be cushion, it could be steroid use, it could be hypothyroidism or thyrotoxicosis. Both hypothyroidism and thyrotoxicosis cause muscle weakness. Calcium or potassium metabolism, toxins like ethanol or drugs. Muscular dystrophies, uh, I'm sure you have taken some of these uh, subjects in uh, pediatric lectures. We will cover the most important ones. Uh, like Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. Myotonia is like dystrophia myotonica and myotonia congenita. In general, how we approach a patient with muscle disease? First, by examination, we should search for the distribution of muscle weakness. Usually, muscle weakness causes proximal myopathy, but this is not 100% a rule because we have some distal myopathies, but these are rare conditions. In general, there will be proximal weakness. There will be pr preserved reflexes. The muscle may be atrophied, or in some conditions, it may be uh, hypertrophied, like, uh, for example, in Duchenne. Then we send for some basic investigations for muscle disease, like creatine phosphokinase and aldolase. These are highly elevated in muscular dystrophies and inflammatory myopathies. It could be normal in myasthenia gravis, lambert eaton muscular dystrophy, and other myotonias. Genetic probes in patients with family members are helpful in diagnosis of muscular dystrophies. EMG is very useful. Well, it's one of the uh, standard investigations that are sent for muscle disease. Muscle biopsy usually gives you the definite diagnosis of different types of muscular dystrophies by immunohistochemistry of the muscle. We may get the exact disease. MRI may be helpful also in some conditions. Let's talk about important uh, subjects in uh, this lecture. The most important one is myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is an acquired condition characterized by weakness and fatigability of proximal muscles, ocular and bulbar muscles. The heart is not affected. It's twice as common in women as in men. By the way, because myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease, usually the autoimmune diseases are, in general are more common in female and they are more common in young age females usually. The cause is unknown. They are IgG antibodies affecting the acetylcholine receptor protein. Uh, after a while, I will talk about the pathophysiology of this disease. Immune complex, which is IgG and complement, are deposited at the postsynaptic membrane, causing interference with and later destruction of the acetylcholine receptor.
Myasthenia gravis, uh, the cause is related to thymic hyperplasia. In some cases, about 70% of the patients, they have thymic hyperplasia. It is believed that this thymic hyperplasia will produce these IgG antibodies that will attack the postsynaptic acetylcholine uh, re receptors and at the beginning it will block it. Later on, it will destroy it and it causes flattening of the postsynaptic membrane. Usually it is present in 70% of patients who, ha who are below 40 years of age. About 10% of this thymic hyperplasia, or about 10%, sorry, of them, they have thymic tumor, which is called thymoma, rather than thymic hyperplasia. And one third of these thymic tumors are malignant. It could be an association between myasthenia gravis and other autoimmune diseases, like thyroid disease, rheumatoid disease, pernicious anemia, SLE. autoimmune. Whenever uh, you diagnose an autoimmune disease, you also screen for other autoimmune diseases. This picture shows the neuromuscular junction. So what happens at the neuromuscular junction? Acetylcholine is synthesized in the motor nerve terminal stored in vesicles. These are the vesicles. When an action potential travels via the, via the motor neuron and reaches the nerve terminal, acetylcholine from about 150 to 200 vesicles is released and combines with acetylcholines that are densely packed at the peak of postsynaptic faults. These are the postsynaptic faults where it contains the acetylcholine receptors. These acetylcholine receptors have five subunits. The one which is important in myasthenia gravis is the alpha subunit. When acetylcholine combines with the alpha subunit in the channel of the acetylcholine, it will open and rapidly uh, uh, causes entry of cations, chiefly sodium, which produces depolarization at the end plate region of the muscle fiber. If the depolarization is sufficiently large, it initiates an action potential. This will propagate along the nerve terminal, causes contraction of the muscle, and uh, an action potential happens. In myasthenia gravis, the fundamental defect is a decrease in the number of available receptors. At the beginning, these uh, antibodies that are produced in myasthenia gravis, it will destroy, it will, sorry, block the receptor, the postsynaptic membrane receptor. After a while, because of the chronicity of the disease, it will cause damage to the postsynaptic membrane. So there will be flattening and simplicity of the postsynaptic membrane. These changes result in a decreased efficiency of neuromuscular transmission. Therefore, although acetylcholine is released normally, it produces small end plate potentials that may fail to trigger muscle action potential. Failure of transmission at many neuromuscular junctions result in weakness of contraction. Clinical features. Myasthenia gravis has a bimodal pattern of onset. It occurs most commonly in women, as we said, second and third decades of life. There might be another peak in the sixth as seventh decade. In this case, men are predominantly affected. Usually it affects the extraocular muscles. It starts by extraocular muscles. The patient presents with diplopia, in, all, in some directions, sometimes in all directions, there will be ptosis, partial ptosis. There is asymmetry, asymmetric ptosis. And when you examine the extraocular muscles, it doesn't fit weakness of the nerve. I mean, if you third cranial nerve palsy, it's a feature of the type Sixth feature of the Fourth feature of the You see that in myasthenia gravis, there, the pattern doesn't uh, is, uh, the pattern is not compatible with any specific cranial nerve disorder. The defect is not in the nerve, it is in the neuromuscular junction. Later on, it involves the bulbar muscles. The patient may have dysphagia, may have dysarthria in the form of nasal speech. Gradually, he becomes having a nasal speech. Weakness remains localized to ocular muscles in 15% of the patients. I'm group of ocular myasthenia. Whenever myasthenia gravis 
remains in the extraocular muscles only for more than two years, it is regarded as a case of ocular myasthenia. Now, an ocular myasthenia is benign uh, in comparison to generalized myasthenia. Even the mode of management is different. If a patient has ocular myasthenia alone, there is no need to do thymectomy for him. The jaw, facial muscles, speech, or swallow all may be affected, as we said. When you examine such cases, there is fatigability or fatigable weakness. We have some tests that we do for the patient. For example, we ask the patient to count uh, up to 10 by one breath. Most of them, they cannot finish. There is another test you ask the patient to abduct his arm, arm abduction for two minutes. You ask the patient to elevate his eye, look upward for 30 seconds. There is a test which is called ice pack test, cooling of the eye with an ice pack. This will cause improvement of the symptoms, but the specificity and sensitivity of this test is not certain. Ophthalmoplegia, as we said, is fatigable. Do not fit the pattern of single cranial nerve weakness. Medial, inferior rectus, and superior oblique are the most commonly affected. Up to 20% of patients with myasthenia have predominant bulbar symptom. This is also another problem. Some patients have bulbar myasthenia gravis. The problem with this disease is that those who have bulbar myasthenia gravis, they usually don't respond to the conventional uh, treatment given to other patients with myasthenia gravis. You give him steroid, there is no benefit. You uh, give him uh, steroid sparing cytotoxic drugs, there is also no uh, benefit. The drug that patients get benefit of it uh, in patients when those who have bulbar myasthenia is plasma pharesis or IVIG. Uh, we have seen few patients with bulbar myasthenia. They usually respond to sessions of IVIG or plasma exchange and they respond dramatically, but every now and then you should repeat until the patient becomes stable. Respiratory muscle may be affected causing myasthenic crisis. The symptoms typically worsen at the end of the day with extreme heat. They are also exacerbated by emotional stress, infection, pregnancy, and menstruation. How we investigate such cases? First, the diagnosis is clinical. You diagnose clinically. Later on, you send for specific tests which are useful for the diagnosis. The most important one is acetylcholine receptor antibody. You send for a quantitative measurement of acetylcholine receptor uh, antibody, which is positive in about 90% of those who have generalized myasthenia gravis. If the patient has ocular myasthenia, the sensitivity of this test will decrease to less than 40%. 50%. Approximately 10% of them, those who are negative, may have anti-musk antibody, muscle-specific receptor tyrosine kinase. So usually, if we receive a patient with ocular myasthenia, we send for both anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody and anti-musk antibody. Another important investigation is nerve stimulation. Also, it's called repetitive nerve stimulation. Usually when you stimulate a, a muscle by a repetitive electrical stimulation with a normal uh, frequency, usually the frequency is up to 10, 10 hertz, not high frequency. This is called normal frequency. Normally nothing happens. In myasthenia gravis, after three action potentials, there will be decrease in the amplitude of action potential by about 30%. Whenever after three action potentials, the amplitude has reduced to 30%. This is pathological and it is highly characteristic of myasthenia gravis. Yes, this is also done. Uh, usually we don't do this test. First, because we don't have hydrophonium and because it is dangerous. It should be done in a CCU where resuscitative measures are av uh, available because it may cause cardiac arrest. You give the anticholinesterase hydrophonium 10 milligram after a test dose of 1 to 2 milligram, it's, it's given IV. It will cause a rapid improvement of the symptoms after a few seconds, and it will last for 2 to 3 minutes.
When you receive a patient, you confirm the diagnosis of myasthenia, then you should search for thymic hyperplasia or thymoma. If it's thymic hyperplasia, it's present in about 70% of them. In cases of thymoma, usually when you do thymic hyper, uh, thymectomy for such cases, uh, it affects the long-term prognosis. That's why thymectomy is done for such cases. Also, thymoma, you should search for malignancy because one-third of them have a malignant thymoma. So as chest CT is indicated, routine tests should be done, including CPK, which is normal. Uh, you should also search for other Im uh, autoimmune diseases. How we manage such cases? Because the disease is chronic and it will fluctuate in severity. So some patients may need lifelong course. Simple monitoring tests such as duration of the arm. This uh, we also uh, we talked about these tests actually. Uh, sometimes exacerbation happen. It causes causes myasthenia gravis, Esabasi uh, We should avoid enema for such cases because it contains magnesium sulfate. It may provoke severe. What are the lines of uh, management? These are the drugs actually that may exacerbate myasthenia gravis. Antibiotics, nachoshika. Uh, myasthenia here we should be aware aminoglycosides are dangerous antiarrhythmics quinine quinidine lidocaine and beta blockers anti-epileptic phenytoin is dangerous anti-rheumatoid depenicillamine and uh, chloroquine and neuromuscular blocking agents which are used during myasthenia should be avoided when you send for surgery you should ask the uh, anesthesia not to give neuromuscular blocking agents are the lines of management first oral anti-estalcholine esterase pyridostigmine is the drug most widely used it prolongs estalcholine action by inhibiting estalcholine esterase the pathophysiologic abasmanker estalcholine in now synaptic membrane or in the post synaptic membrane there are estalcholine esterase enzymes that will destroy the estalcholine this drug will inhibit estalcholine esterase so it will prolong the life of Acetylcholine. It will increase the amount of acetylcholine in the synaptic membrane. Thymectomy is very important. It has been shown that those who have got thymic hyperplasia, they are before the age of 40. If you do thymectomy, after 10 years, 70% of them may go into complete remission. And nine, uh, sorry, uh, and 90% of them may have very mild symptoms. After Thym uh, thymectomy after few years we decrease the dose of the drugs and some of them even they are actually drug free now they completely recovered this is done for patients below the age of 40 there are some exceptions of course elderly those even who have thymoma they should undergo surgery also because of the risk of malignancy but those who have thymoma usually they don't get benefit of the surgery which means that if you do thymectomy uh, the symptom of myasthenia will not improve in patients with thymoma you start by immunosuppressant drugs along with oral or anticholine esterases the first drug is steroid Tomato steroid a high dose of AA8 it causes many side effects usually you give the steroid every other day you ask the patient to take prednisolone every other day, not every day, until the symptoms improve. After two to three months, you should start a drug which is called steroid sparing agent, either mycophenolate or azathioprine. These are the most uh, two agents which are used in myasthenia gravis. When you start, for example, mycophenolate, after a few months, when it starts to act, you can reduce the dose of steroid to reduce the side effects. Later on, after, for example, six months or one year, you see that the patient is on full dose of mycophenolate, only a very small dose of steroid. Sometimes you even can stop the steroid after a few months if the patient is stable on mycophenolate or azathioprine. Plasma pharesis and IVIG are given in patients with myasthenic crisis. myasthenic crisis it indicates the development of ventilatory failure when the muscle weakness affects the respiratory muscle 
the patient should be admitted into uh, the intensive care unit. This may happen in 20% of patients with myasthenia. Respiratory failure in myasthenia may be precipitated by pneumonia, infection, drugs, the drugs that we talked about in the table, surgery, inadequate treatment, rapid lowering of the steroids, giving enema. In acute respiratory failure, urgent elective tracheal intubation and ventilation should be considered when the vital capacity is below 15 per mil, mil per kilogram. The vital capacity is below You should put the patient on ventilator and you should immediately start intravenous immunoglobulin or plasma pharesis. Another subject which is called cholinergic crisis. The feature of cholinergic crisis somehow resembles myasthenic crisis, but bear in mind that cholinergic crisis is a rare condition. Cholinergic crisis or myasthenic crisis or near. It is extremely rare. This is caused by the drugs that we give to treat myasthenia gravis. It may cause cholinergic crisis. Anticholin esterases like pyridosigmine, when it is given in high dose, it may cause muscle weakness. It should be suspected in patients taking high doses of anticholin esterase who, who have extensive cholinergic side effects. طبعا بس شيء suspicion cholinergic crisis setting. When you give anticholin uh, esterase in high dose, it causes sweating, hypersalivation, excessive bronchial excretion. لها مو مهم ترسيري تشاوي كي تسيري كي ما يوصيها. يعني cholinergic activity زور زورة. Eventually, it will cause flaccid weakness. In such cases, you should admit the patient into the intensive care unit. You should intubate him, and you should withdraw all anticholinergic medications. You stop the medication and keep the patient for on ventilation for a while until he becomes stable. Pregnancy and myasthenia gravis. This is a very important issue. Why? Because myasthenia gravis is um, common in women and it's common in young women below the age of 40. That's why pregnancy is a very important issue. It may worsen, improve or remain stable during pregnancy. But usually during perpidium there will be deterioration after the pregnancy is finished. Pregnancy should ideally be planned when the patient is strong Steroids should be maintained at a lowest therapeutic dose. If possible, other immunosuppressants should be avoided. One steroid is very safe to treat pregnancy. If you compare it with mycophenolate or azathioprine, uh, pregnancy is the uh, sorry, steroid is the best one. Agar na khoshak bas lasar steroid be okay ta zor bashtra. If preeclampsia occurs, magnesium sulfate should not be given because of the risk of weakness. The newborn infant is at risk of transient neonatal myasthenia, which occurs in about 10%. This usually is caused by transmission of acetylcholine receptor antibodies across the placenta. Sometimes they even need ventilation, but it is a self-limiting disease, actually. Another subject is Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome is a paraneoplastic disease. So it is usually associated with malignancy. The most common one is, is small cell carcinoma of the lung. It has also been detected with other malignancies, but this is the most common one. The characteristic feature of Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome is there is muscle weakness, just like myasthenia gravis. But uh, in contrary to myasthenia gravis, it usually improves with exercise. By exercise, it will improve. Second, there will be areflexia. And third, there will be autonomic symptom in the form of dry mouth and erectile dysfunction. There will be weakness of the thigh muscle. There will be loss of knee reflex. And there will be autonomic symptom. Unlike myasthenia, extraocular muscles are not involved. Lambert Eaton myasthenic syndrome is caused by antibodies to presynaptic voltage gated calcium channel in motor and autonomic nerve terminals that will disrupt the influx of calcium and decrease the release of acetylcholine. And the Lambert Eaton is acetylcholine is not one of the most important things. The post-synaptic membrane is damaged. Lambert Eaton is a disease of presynaptic membrane. Characteristically, 
when you do repetitive nerve stimulation for such cases, there will be an incremental response with supramaximal repetitive nerve stimulation. يعني اگر بیان یوکو مایستین اگر ایوز repetitive nerve stimulation ایبا بکی In normal frequency, up to 10 Hz, there will be no response. هیچ چگر رو نایا. But in supramaximal stimulation, there will be incremental response. یعنی action potential اگر گو رجا بیتو لجا عطی پچو گو بیتو. Supramaximal, usually it is in the range of 100 to 200 Hz. In myasthenia, up to 10, 10 to 20 Hz are used. In Lambert eaten, 100 to 200 Hz are used and there will be incremental response. How we manage? We should treat underlying malignancy. Pyridostigmine may be of benefit. 3 for that aminopyridine also and other immunosuppressant agents may be useful to treat uh, Lambert eaten myasthenic syndrome. Another important uh, subject is botulism. Botulism is a highly potent neurotoxin elaborated by Clostridium botulinum, which is an aerobic gram-positive rod, survives in soil by forming spoils. There are eight antigenically, uh, sorry, antigenically distinct strains of uh, the toxin. In foodborne botulism, the toxin is absorbed from the GI tract, hematogenously disseminated. The toxin will bind irreversibly to presynaptic membrane of the peripheral or neuromuscular junction or autonomic nervous system. It will inhibit acetylcholine release. Taqriban amoku Lambert eaten myasthenic syndrome. It's a disease of presynaptic membrane. It will inhibit the release of acetylcholine. Botulism her obotoxica khalchibo juan kari ba kari hene. It is elaborated by this microorganism and it will cause irreversible. Uh, uh, damage to the nerve irreversibly it will not uh, function recovery depends on the sprouting of new nerve terminals when when it is caused by a wound it has a longer incubation period you have many forms of botulism infantile especially neonatal uh, raw honey may contain Clostridium botulinum. It may cause infantile botulism. Foodborne, wound, iatrogenic and inhalational, which could be part of bioterrorism. I actually, uh, I have seen one case of botulism. It was a child and he presented with internal and external ophthalmoplegia, bulbar palsy. Later on, he developed weakness and we did uh, repetitive nerve stimulation. The repetitive nerve stimulation is highly characteristic for such cases, we will talk about uh, in a few minutes. The patient presents, if it's a foodborne, usually it takes 12 to 36 hours for the symptom to happen. It is a pyrexial disease, got a fever in Abia, but only there will be feature of gastroenteritis in the form of nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and abdominal pain. Later on, it will affect the cranial nerves. It causes external and internal ophthalmoplegia. Most man lechile external internal ophthalmoplegia. External ophthalmoplegia, the patient cannot move the eyes in all directions. Internal ophthalmoplegia, there will be loss of pupillary light reflex. Later on, the bulbar muscles will be affected, causing dysarthria, dysphagia, dysphonia, facial weakness. Later on, there will be descending flaccid paralysis. Regba axi guliamberio la damuchayo despiakao duayeta huaro. It may affect the respiratory muscle and autonomic nervous system, and the patient may need intubation. How we diagnose? Usually the diagnosis of is clinical from history and examination. If you do CSF, it is normal. Blood examination is normal. The microorganism may be isolated from the wound, stool, or food. The toxin also may be isolated. But repetitive nerve stimulation is very important for the diagnosis. The, when you do it at normal frequency, it may cause decremental response. But when you do it uh, in high frequency, like Lambert eaten myasthenic crisis, there is incremental response. So you see both decremental and incremental response. Uh, they are normal, but repetitive stimulation shows decremental response at low rates and incremental response at high rates. This is highly characteristic of botulism. How we manage such cases? 
Administration of Antitoxin طبعا هم Antitoxin ده زناك اوكي سيكا من هم بو نليرة هبو نلير نيبرين countries هبو او ايكا بوه هنام اشون بو توكسا كان بوه هنام هر توكسينة كان بوه هنام You should bring Antitoxin It may cause allergy so you should monitor the patient carefully It doesn't reverse the weakness Only it will prevent progression Wound debridement if it is a wound causing the disease Antibiotic which is effective against Clostridium botulinum is benzyl, penicillin, and metronidazole. Supportive care, as we said, agar nakhosha katushi respiratory failure bu, he should be admitted to the ICU and uh, endotracheal intubation may be needed. If it's a foodborne disease, it should be notified because it's a notifiable disease. We just finished the subject of muscle disease, uh, neuromuscular junction disorders. Now we will talk about muscular dystrophies. Muscular dystrophies are a group of inherited myopathies characterized by, characterized by progressive muscular weakness and loss of bulk. Uh, the diagnosis of most of the muscular dystrophies are clinical, but definite diagnosis and to do the subtyping of the, or definite diagnosis is usually by genetic test. Table shows us the most common types. Duchenne and Becker, these are the two which are X linked recessive. They happen in male. It causes pelvic girdle weakness, rapid progression, and pseudo hypertrophy, especially of the calf muscles. The difference between them is that in Becker muscular dystrophy, the heart is less commonly involved. Uh, there is no cognitive impairment, and patient become, uh, patients remain mobile even after the age of 16. Unlike Duchenne, in Duchenne, by, uh, by the age of 13, they become confined to wheelchair. Another group is the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, which are either autosomal dominant or recessive. They have many subtypes. Limb girdle type 1 from A to E, type 2 from A to G. They affect the pelvic and shoulder girdles. We have a group of distal muscular dystrophies also, which are autosomal dominant. We have specific types of muscular dystrophies, like Emery Dreyfus. Emery Dreyfus could be autosomal dominant or X-linked recessive. The characteristic feature of Emery Dreyfus is contractures. Usually, it causes elbow contractures. And patients with Emery Dreyfus have characteristic cardiac conduction blocks. So, block. whenever you suspect Emery Dreyfus, you should screen for cardiac conduction abnormalities. Another disease is facioscapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. These patients usually they don't have cardiac uh, conduction abnormality. The characteristic feature of them is scapular winging. Oculopharyngeal is another disease. This happens in French Canadians. It's common in Quebec, the Quebec district in Canada. Uh, French Canadians have it. They, it causes dysphagia and ocular weakness. We have a group of congenital muscular dystrophies. And we have myotonic disorders. Dystrophia myotonica or myotonic dystrophy, type 1 and type 2. These have characteristic features. Type 1 causes myotonia, facial and distal muscle weakness rather than proximal. Frontal baldness, cataract, cardiac conduction defect, and diabetes. It causes also testicular atrophy. In myotonia, we have the same feature, but there is proximal weakness rather than distal weakness. Duchenne and Becker, they are the most common form of muscular dystrophies, and I'm sure you have taken a lecture on it uh, in your pediatric uh, session. It usually starts before the age of 5, usually it starts at the age of 3 or 4. There is proximal weakness, gait and posture abnormality, pseudo-hypertrophy, and usually cognitive impairment. They have a lordotic posture, uh, they, they have Toe walking, frequent fall, and the mother usually describes that although his calf is very large, but he is weak. It's called Herculean calf. Uh, Becker muscular dystrophy is the same, but as we said, it is milder. They usually, patients with Duchenne are confined to wheelchair at the age of 13 or before the age of 13. Unlike Becker, the two chances show her to an Dystrophy deficiency is thought to initiate the degenerative changes in the muscle. 
Muscular dystrophy should be considered a multi-system disorder and special attention should be given to patient's cardiopulmonary status. You should take care of the cardiac and pulmonary status of the patient. When you investigate, the CPK is highly elevated. Inducing steroid may give some improvement. Actually, it is not so much. But physiotherapy is important. You should treat scoliosis and contracture. Orthopedic consultation. Monitoring of the cardiac and respiratory uh, status is very important in such cases. Whenever the patient reaches the age of 10 years, patients should have follow-up cardiac assessment twice annually. And when he reaches the age of 12, the capacity of the lung will decrease. So uh, annually you should do uh, pulmonary checking every, uh, twice a week, uh, a day, uh, so, sorry, twice a year. This slide shows the mode of inheritance of Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. It happens in because it is X-linked recessive. It happens uh, in male. It may ex uh, rarely happen in female in two conditions. One of them is called lionization, when one X chromosome is not functioning. Uh, the other one is that extremely rare cases of autosomal recessive uh, Duchenne has been diagnosed. This is Gower sign in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The patient, when he, he is uh, on the ground and he tries to stand up, he climbs on himself. The robotic posture of a patient with uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and look at the uh, foot of the patient. There is two walking and there is lordotic posture. About pseudo hypertrophy in a patient with Duchenne. This is another picture showing uh, Gower sign when the patient climbs on himself to stand up. Another uh, disease is myotonic dystrophy. Well, we talked about it in the table. We said it is type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is the most common one actually. It is dominantly inherited. It usually happens in the third or fourth decade of life. Myotonia accompanies weakness and wasting of the facial, sternocleidomastoid and distal muscles. There will be contraction of the muscle with slow relaxation. If you tap the thinner eminence with a hammer, there will be contraction of the thumb. This is called myotonia. Later on, muscular, uh, sorry, uh, wasting happens. It causes wasting of the facial muscle, wasting of the sternocleidomastoid, wasting of the temporalis muscle. Later on, the patient develops cataract, frontal baldness, testicular atrophy, diabetes, cardiac conduction abnormalities, respiratory disturbance, sleep apnea, intellectual and behavioral change, hypogammaglobulinemia, sudden death may happen due to arrhythmia. This is the characteristic face of a patient with myotonic dystrophy. You see the gynecomastia, the cataract, and the wasting. And if you give something to the patient, there will be contraction, slow relaxation. If you hammer the thinner eminence, there will be contraction of the thumb. This is the characteristic face use of a patient with dystrophia myotonica type 1. Characteristic uh, appearance of a patient with myotonic dystrophy. Diagnosis is clinical. You can send for genetic testing to confirm the diagnosis. EMG may show myopathy and myotonic discharges. Serum enzymes may be slightly elevated or normal. And ECG is very important in such cases for detection of cardiac conduction abnormalities. Management is usually uh, includes the use of assistive devices as needed for weakness. Management of complication is more important than the disease. We treat cataract, we treat diabetes, and we send the patient to a cardiologist for cardiac arrhythmia. Phenytoin usually causes decrease of the myotonia. 
phenytoin is the main management of myotonia. Other drugs may also be used for myotonia like prokinamide and mexilefine, but these are dangerous if there is cardiac conduction abnormality. This picture shows us scapular in, in a patient with facial scapular humor muscular dystrophy. طبعا تيست في واقري. قال لي لا ديواري كوغوستو بالبا ديواري كوغنيا. You see that there is scapular winging in a patient with facial scapular humor muscular dystrophy. And another patient with oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, the French Canadian, as we said, there is uh, facial weakness. This is a patient with Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. As we said, there is contracture mainly in the elbow. And such cases have cardiac conduction abnormality, so we should screen for cardiac anomaly. Another important subject that we will talk about are the inflammatory myopathies. We have three important uh, diseases, dermatomyositis, polymyositis, and inclusion body myositis. Dermatomyositis may happen in children or in adults. When it happens in children, it is usually autoimmune. When it happens in adults over the age of 40 years, we should suspect malignancy. It could be a paraneoplastic disease. It usually affects the muscles, causing weakness over several weeks. First, it affects the esophageal muscles causing dysphagia. Later on, there will be a skin characteristic, skin lesion characteristic to dermatomyositis. It causes blue to violet discoloration of the upper eyelid, which is called heliotrope rash. Edema, papular, and erythematous scaly lesion over the knuckles of the hand, it's called Gotran sign. Also, a sun sensitive flat erythematous rash can appear on the face, neck, and anterior chest. Other manifestations, uh, because it's an inflammatory, uh, subacute inflammatory disease, it may also affect the heart, causing pericarditis and myocarditis, even it may cause heart failure. P uh, dermatomyositis may be associated, as we said, with malignancies, may be associated with other autoimmune diseases like scleroderma, mixed connective tissue disease, or interstitial lung diseases. If it's associated with interstitial lung diseases, usually it's associated with anti and antibody. In such cases, methotrexate is contraindicated, actually, because methotrexate is one of the lines of management of such diseases. It shouldn't be given if there is interstitial lung disease. As we said, it is associated with malignancy. The risk of malignancy is greater for patients above 40 years of age. Therefore, cancer screening is recommended annually for about three years after the diagnosis. How we do workup? We do CBC, CPK, ESR. CPK is elevated in dermatomyositis and polymyositis. It is slightly elevated in uh, inclusion body myositis. Urine analysis and stool specimen for occult block. CT of the chest and abdomen. Uh, mammography for women. Prostate and testicular evaluation for men. Colonoscopy is recommended if the patient is above 50 years of age. And this should be done annually, actually, uh, up to three years, uh, because sometimes the paraneoplastic manifestation appears before the disease. Do I do cell diagnosis? Do I do cell diagnosis? Do I do breast cancer? Do I do colon cancer? That shows us the heliotrope rash of the upper lid and the Gotran sign over the knuckle of the hand. Polymyositis, on the other hand, is not associated with malignancy, but it may be associated with other autoimmune diseases like Crohn's disease, vasculitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, discoid lupus, adult celiac. No definite association has been shown between polymyositis and malignancy. Inclusion body myositis is the third type, the third most common type. It has a unique characteristic feature. First, it happens in elderly patients. Second, it affects the distal muscles only. Third, it is usually refractory to immunosuppressant therapy. How they present? They present with weakness and atrophy of the quadriceps. Characteristically, they affect the quadriceps. They affect the volar 
forearm muscles, wrist and finger flexor. So they present with wasting of the small muscle of the hand and they affect the ankle dorsiflexor. Nahoshaket foot drop here, wasting small muscle hand here, quadriceps femoris is also affected. A familial association has been shown. It may be associated with other connective tissue diseases, but no definite association with malignancy. In general, how we uh, sus, uh, assess such cases, CPK is sent, EMG may show myopathy, biopsy for the definite diagnosis. We should screen for other autoimmune diseases and we should screen for malignancy. Because they are autoimmune diseases, we start by giving steroid. Steroid is given for several months until CPK becomes normal. At the same time with steroid, we should start a steroid sparing agent like methotrexate, azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, cyc uh, mycophenolate mopetil, intravenous immunoglobulin. After 6 to 12 months of giving steroid, we should gradually taper the dose until we reach a maintenance dose of 10. Sometimes we even give 5 mg of steroid after the patient becomes stable. But from the beginning, we should start other immunosuppressive agents. These are called steroid sparing agents so as to decrease the side effect of steroids. Our last subject, uh, Pierre Joy Bassi uh, treatment of inflammatory myopathies, if there is interstitial lung disease, we shouldn't give methotrexate. Just remember this. Group H channelopathies. It affects the channels. They are genetic disorders affecting the channels of the muscle like chloride, sodium, calcium, potassium, like myotonia congenita, paramyotonia congenita, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, hypokalemic periodic paralysis, and Anderson Twell syndrome. It's not important for you, but I mentioned it because in emergency department, Karonbo emergency department, you will face many cases of periodic paralysis. Say that the manga kalawani have two cases periodic paralysis. Do they? They are channelopathies. They are due to either sodium if it is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis or calcium and sodium, or sodium in hypokalemic periodic paralysis. There will be episodic weakness triggered by exercise or high carbohydrate meal. نخوشکه دلیل ریاضم کرد و ای خوارد نیکی شیرینم خوارد نوستم که هستم لخو نتوانم دستو قاشم بجولنم This is the clinical scenario When you receive such cases in the emergency department first you should do ECG because if the potassium is very low it is very dangerous it may cause arrhythmia Then you start treatment In the emergency department you give potassium orally if the patient has nausea and vomiting, cannot tolerate, or if the potassium is very low and you are afraid of cardiac arrhythmia, you should give intravenous potassium. After you correct the potassium, you put the patient on oral potassium and acetazolamide. Acetazolamide is a line of management. By the way, when you give uh, potassium to such cases, you don't put potassium in normal saline or glucose saline or glucose water like a patient with diarrhea. You put potassium in a glucose saline, for example. In such cases, if you put the, uh, the potassium in glucose saline, you will just exacerbate the weakness. You should put it in mannitol. And uh, whenever there is hyperkalemia, hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, there might be association with thyrotoxicosis. But if there is thyrotoxicosis, there is hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. And so if there is hyperkalemia, you scream for thyrotoxicosis. This was my last lecture. And uh, next week, Dr. Zana will start with you. Thank you very much.